to go is for organising such a great day. Um, so the material I'm going to present today comes um, majority from my PhD thesis, but the theme of invisibility is quite new, so I welcome comments um, afterwards. Okay, so from the brink of death, let's move to um, mobility and the, the living body. Every quarter of an hour on Fleet Street, two giants raise their clubs and strike the time against the church bells of St. Dunstan in the West. The life-sized figures perform their temporal labor staged upon flint. The strength of their bodies is signaled in the exaggerated calf, mu calf muscles of braced legs, feet staggered so as to support the alternating motions of their arms as they beat the two large hanging bells. These wooden figures are part of a clock mechanism that was conceived and installed by Thomas Harris in 1671 for the church and remain a functioning feature of the facade today. As an automata, the self-moving figures stop and start, demonstrating the function of the muscles to organize the movements of the body. The automata are known simply as the giants of St. Dunstan, Dunstan's in 17th century sources and have been named as the mythological guardians of London, Gog and Magog. Later, in the early 18th century, described as savages or Hercules, the antique iconography of the pair is recognized through the bulging musculature, lion skin cloths, and large knotted wooden clubs. The St. Dunstan's automata are cited in the parish records as the first public clock in London to have a minute hand. The larger than life sculptural forms and the motions of the giants cannot be separated from their function as a physical embodiment of measured time. At the same time, the mechanism itself can be understood as an analogy for the movements of the many muscles of the body assembled into a working, moving whole. In other words, as a pair of moving automata, the figures simultaneously signal the early modern English focus on the mechanical workings of the human form. Placed upon a busy thoroughfare between civic, the civic city of London and the royal authorities of Westminster, the physical movements of the body are echoed in the rhythmic motion of Londoners passing below a street level. The form, presence, and purpose of these figures are a useful starting point for the discussion of animation, muscular anatomy, and the semantic potential of ancient and modern statutory to represent the invisible mechanics of the body. The mechanical metaphor for the body in late 17th century London, physically enacted by the St. Dunstan's automata, was established by a panoply of mechanical philosophers in 17th century Europe who were interested in the physiological causes that fuel the animated actions of the moving body. Most famously, this connection between body and machine was put forward in the work of philosopher and mathematician René Descartes. In a much cited passage of Descartes' Treatise on Man, printed posthumously in the 1660s, the author describes his conceptual model of man as machine. In his theory, widely known and referred to as Cartesian dualism, the functions of the body are separated from those of the mind. The body represents the material matter of the knowable world as governed by a series of universal laws whereas the immaterial mind relies upon the invisible motions of the soul in communication with the cognitive functions of the brain. The functional actions supported by the muscular system as they relate to walking, breathing, and digestion are understood by Descartes as the involuntary bodily actions of the animal machine. The aim of the treatise of man is to explain the physiological functions of the body, which, the author states, because of their smallness, are invisible. He continues, I shall be able to make them known to you most simply and clearly by speaking of the movements which depend upon them. Following this framework, invisible motions, for example, the passions of the soul, can be represented by the, in, by the voluntary actions of the muscular system. The muscles thus made the invisible visible. This is the subject of my paper today. The myological body, seen as a machine, made, in, made the invisible workings of the body present. The animation of the lively body, therefore, presents a foundational challenge within early modern artistic culture. 
how to represent muscular action. Just going to move that because it's driving me crazy. <laughs> okay. Bearing the muscular automata of the two giants of Fleet Street and Descartes' mechanical human body in mind, in this paper I will now turn to an anatomy book that deals specifically with the muscles of the body, John Brown's Treaties of the Muscles. This volume was first published a moment from here in the Savoy in 1681. In the book, 40 engraved plates explicate the muscular structures of the human body. And um, you can see a selection of these on the screen now. These plates, uh, these plates measure around 24 by 16 centimeters, so about that, that big. Um, it is not only a practical guide for the dissection theater, but a luxurious presentational illustrated volume produced for the study of myological anatomy. The book itself is framed as an anatomical investigation of the muscles, how they can be described in minute detail, what they look like, the physical matter they, they are made up of, how they function, and their connections to the skeletal and visceral systems that enable them to power the limbs of the body in a series of voluntary and involuntary movements. Brown states, for example, that one intention of the treaties is to enlarge the discourse of muscular motion as theorized by the Danish anatomist Nicholas Steno. Steno's study of the muscles under the lens of a microscope showed the shortening of fibers that took place to instigate, in Brown's, in Brown's words, the movement of nervous spirits and the distribution of life to all parts of the body. The discussion of mind and body, internal and external, voluntary and involuntary motion in both Descartes and Brown's treaties raises an important issue of visual representation. Brown's preface to one of the final 1698 editions also describes how anatomists in the late 17th century were still grappling with the fact that the spirits that cause muscular contraction and move the limbs of the body could not be seen in dissection or even by the help of any microscope whatsoever. Despite the impact of the microscope on the way the material structure of the muscle was visualized, bodily movements still proved difficult to explain. The utility of the volume, in other words, was its ability to synthesize into one view the invisible mechanisms of the physiological body. The body parts are assembled into holistic figures which make the internal movements apparent through external posture and gesture. The plates of the volume have been innovatively revised by Brown and his engraver from an early 17th century Italian anatomy by Giulio Casirio printed in Venice. In the 16th plate, for example, the figure presenting the muscles of the upper body perched at the top of the lymph, seated in an elegant pose, ankles crossed, right arm resting upon a cane. Placing this plate next to its Italian precedent underlines the ways in which the plate has been adapted for the 1680s English context. Whilst the posture and the subject of the two engravings are the same, the framing of Brown's plate is more elaborate and includes a carved pedestal and lakeside setting. Furthermore, instead of the cloth cap of Caserius' sleep, seemingly sleeping figure, Brown's alert model support, sports a stylish head of curls. This feature is a striking inclusion, which appears in the other plates of the muscles and serves to locate the volume in the cultural sphere of elite London society. The connection between Casirio's and Brown's images has led to Brown's plate plates frequently being dismissed as whimsical or bizarre copies, and the text of the volume was noted by contemporary commentators, that's contemporary 17th century commentators, to have plagiarized the muscular discourse of the anatomist William Mullins. In spite of this notoriety, or perhaps as a result of it, the volume was clearly a commercial success and was printed in, a, in at least 10 editions between 1681 and 1705. Furthermore, the plates of many earlier anatomical treaties frequently referred to as subsequent images as a framework. Cynthia Klesternek, amongst others, has referred to such moments as recycling where we see a kind of repackaging of the visual material in order to make the figures of the treaties relevant to the readership for which it was reproduced. The tension between imitation and innovation that relates Brown's anatomical models to previous publications should be seen, therefore, as a productive tension. It marks a moment of metamorphosis where the muscular body that is being investigated in the anatomy book 
might be seen to intervene in, to intervene in the making of a type of social body, more specifically, the animated, civil, public body of late 17th century London. In my doctoral research, I'm concerned with the multiple ways Brown's London plates intimately relate to various elements of the capital's artistic, fashionable, and theatrical culture. Within the confines of this paper today, however, it is the invisible mechanics of the muscles and the significant visual reference to public statutory that is the focus. The concept of machinic animation surfaces in the anatomical image. Plate 7 of Brown's volume, for example, shows the muscles of the face in situ in the form of an encochet head, but also broken into parts that display the nose and ears in their dissected form. So the encochet head is figure that figure one in the left. Both plates reveal the musculature that binds the parts of the head into a moving assemblage. The profile of the face is animated. Here, eyes open and looking forwards, mouth slightly parted to reveal the top row of teeth. The muscles specifically attached to the jaw, shown at figures five and six, are described in the text as, quote, like a pulley, drawing the mandible downwards and so opening the mouth. This lively representation reminds the viewer that these are the muscles that move the face in a variety of actions, such as opening and shutting the mouth for, as Brown states, the accommodation of eating and drinking, for ornament of speech and love motions. So, talking, perhaps, um, okay. <laughs> Even in the representation of the dissected parts, therefore, the uses of the muscles and the relationship with bodily actions are always tied to the concept of the body as a living whole. The text and images of the treatise then visualise the voluntary and involuntary motions that come to personify Cartesian dualism at this time. Descartes' analogy of man as akin to a statue or earthen machine opens up a slightly different set of questions for the myological plates in regard to the artistic challenge of representing the invisible mechanics of the body. Firstly, in this figure, visual information about the myological system is captured in the lively posture of the dissected figure, which cannot be called a cadaver, but rather an animated demi encochet the indeterminate gesture of the figure offers the viewer an action that conveys an emotional purpose. Yet the presence of the plinth and the evocation of the stillness of sculptural form could be seen to contradict this aspect. The historical precedent for anatomical studies, wherein the figure takes on the visual framework of sculptural form, is discussed by Glenn Harcourt as a visual practice used to mask the messy viscerality of the dissected body. Harcourt points to the idea that the use of sculpture evokes a median, ideal body. By quoting the poses of well-known anti antique statues, the figures convey the strength and grace of the body, the muscular action thereby contributes to the pedagogical effect of the image. As a stylistic feature, the pedestal base elevates the various figures, providing a foundation for an anatomical culture of display and establishing a visual structure for their demonstrative postures and gestures. The plinth can also be understood as the trope with which to initiate discussion of the staging of the body, modes of viewing, and the spectatorial dynamics. Furthermore, the presentation of the human body as sculptural form can be seen to draw out the issue of how the body moves and remains still. Within the 17th century, sorry, within the 17th century London context of viewing Brown's plates amidst conversations of automata and the mechanics of muscular motion, the visual connection to statutory can also be seen to do something different. Whilst tied to the iconographic history of classical sculptural form, the knowledge of the myological body presented in idealized postures opens up a range of new questions about action, courtesy, civility, and social mobility in late 17th century London. The animation of the body is demonstrated in the elegant carriage and the stepping gait of these figures. The presence of the plinth, paradoxically, focuses the beholder's attention on the tense stillness of the body, supported by the functional work of the muscles in the act of holding the pose. Fashionable late 17th century items such as wigs and canes endow these two figures with a refined social persona. As such, 
the plates to remind the book's beholder of the actions of their own bodies walking through London's newly established squares and parks, where a growing number of sculptural bodies appeared in the form of public statutory. And whilst there isn't really time today to discuss specific geographical and historical contexts of actual sculptures, I'll indicate a few examples for you now. Um, this is a sculpture of King Charles II that still stands in Soho Square and was originally placed there when the square was built in the 1670s. And also in this period, a familiar sight for, for contemporary viewers would have been cast copies of antique statuary, such as the Borghese Gladiator in St. James's Park, which is seen in the centre of this prospect. Um, and then beyond royal parks, numerous statues were also placed in civic spaces, like city guilds, and on the left is a standing figure of Sir John Cutler, which is at the Grocers Hall, and then um, on the right, the funerary monuments, and these seated figures here are attributed to the sculptor William Stanton. Making the link between Brown's treaties and contemporary sculpture in London creates a platform for the further study of the connection between public statutory and pedagogical print culture in this period. Artists drawing books recommend copying from statutory as an important stage in artist training, whilst dance, courtesy, and acting manuals advise that ancient and modern sculpture provide a guide for emulating graceful postures and expressive gestures. Exploring the engraved plates of Brown's volume through the embodied movements of the user emphasizes the fact that the viewing of sculpture is never static. The beholder moves physically to find different viewpoints, whilst the artist seeks to move the viewer emotionally. The ambition stated in the full title of Brown's treaties to explain the role of the muscles in the structure, action, and uses of the human body is directed as much to the reader's active lives as to their contemplative lives. Michael Baxendale's concept of the period I establishes the argument that social experience informs ways of perceiving refined in relation to individual cognitive skills. Baxendale's focus on the effects of social life and cultural practice predominantly explores the production of art objects within a specific culture. In relation to the visual material I've shown you today, the myological body might be understood as a type of period body, wherein phenomenological reception is an important framework, challenging the traditional disciplinary deference to visual, historical, or socio-political methods of our historical interpretation. By focusing on the representation and reception of bodily movement, I argue that the images of Brown's treaties both shaped and were shaped by the lived everyday experience of the mobile 17th century viewer. So, to conclude, 17th century philosophies that conceptualize the moving body as an engineered assemblage of parts provide a framework to consider the muscular actions of the body and the physiological processes of muscular contraction. The use of sculptural form to explore the muscular subject in Brown's treaties raises broader questions about visuality and the representational challenge of bringing a sense of motion to the image. In Brown's volume, therefore, the machinic animation of man becomes more than a metaphor. These sculptural myologies show that by the end of the 17th century, the idea of machinic animation in bodily carriage, posture, and gesture opens up further questions regarding subjectivity, public identity, and ideal conduct. As a result, Brown's muscle men that seek to make the invisible motions of the body visible should be understood to contain multiple types of sociocultural bodily knowledge. <laughs>